Great sideline work by Davis and Crowder. That's an incredible interception by Marcus May. Riding a two-game winning streak, the Jets look to close out the year with three straight victories as they pay a visit to the New England Patriots. What's going on, everybody? And welcome to the season finale of the numbers game. I'm Dan Grossa, joined as always by my co-host from the NFL Network, my buddy, my pal, Cynthia Freeland. Cynthia, great to see you and happy new year. We've made it to 2021. Can you believe it? Woohoo, we did it, but I'm so sad. This is our last show. I know we're gonna have a big cry at the end, but big save cry. your tears because we still have a lot of numbers to spit out here, which we've done all season long. And you're right, it is a little bit bittersweet, but hey, one more game left for the New York Jets. And a red-hot New York Jets team when you consider that they're going to be looking for win number three in a row after knocking off the Cleveland Browns at MetLife Stadium 23-16. to They pick up their first home win of the season in the home finale, ironically enough. Second week in a row, they jumped out to a 20-3 to lead. They did it against the Rams the previous week and hung on again. But you can't say enough about the will and the fight that this team continues to show. The only thing that I was upset about was they broke the streak, the scoring first streak. I mean, that was my favorite streak in all professional sports, but you know, it had to end sometimes. It was a good while it lasted. And the second week in a row that they played spoiler potentially for a team that has their eyes set on the playoffs, right? The Rams still have not clinched and neither of the Cleveland Browns. And if those two teams are on the outside looking in, boy, the Jets will certainly have played a role in that when it's all said and done there. Also, the Jets officially locked up the second pick in next spring's NFL draft. So I'm sure that we're going to have plenty of time over the next weeks and months to debate about what Joe Douglas and company are going to do with that number two pick. It's going to be interesting to see what happens because remember, so much happens between the end of the season and the beginning of the draft, that first night of the draft. It's going to be really interesting. And by the way, no one should ever want to not win games. You always want to win as many games as possible. You can figure out the rest later. And absolutely. And you could see, look at the reaction of the guys in that locker room and on that team when they walked off the field in each of the last two weeks. Jubilation, excitement, throw the record out the window. Those guys want to win. And, you know, they've been playing like it the last two weeks and they're hungry and they want to get one last one before we close the page on this season. All right, let's look back on that Cleveland Browns game from last week. Offensively, six players were on the field for all 69 snaps. Sam Darnold, Mekhi Becton, Pat Elfline, Connor McGovern, George Fant. The starting guard, Josh Andrews, had to leave midway through the game because of an injury, but Rashad Perryman, one of the starting wideouts, was also out there for every snap of the game. But let's start with the quarterback's performance. Sam Darnold, 16 to 32, 175 yards, two touchdown passes, and Cynthia, third game in a row that Sam and the offense have not beaten themselves and haven't committed a turnover. And the second time this season with two or more passing touchdowns. And I want to point out that both of those touchdowns were on 10 plus yard passes, which is really impressive because if you look to see how often he was under pressure, it was over 40%. So lots of pressure, but Sam Darnold was able to not turn the ball over and connect for two touchdowns that were pretty deep. Frank Gore, the running back, the future Hall of Famer. He led the way with 14 carries and 48 yards. And Cynthia, being the numbers aficionado that I know you are, I know that you find it really cool that Frank Gore, as you and I are talking right now for his career, sits at exactly 16,000 yards. He's not going to play against the Patriots because of an injury he suffered. But if this is the end for the future Hall of Famer, boy, that's pretty cool to go out right on the money with 16,000 yards. Very cool. And he also, maybe more importantly, joins two other people, Emmett Smith and Walter Payton, as just the third player in NFL history to reach that elusive mark. I haven't even driven 16,000 yards, I, I think, in my life. So to be able to run that as an NFL back, pretty impressive. And certainly he is to be commended for a, a, a great career, a third round pick out of Miami way back in 2005. Jamison Crowder, another big day for him. Not just seven grabs for 92 yards and a touchdown, but Jamison Crowder decided to get into the act himself. When Adam Gay stove into his bag of tricks, Crowder threw a touchdown pass on an end around to Braxton Berrios, a 43-yard strike. I don't know, Sam Darnold may be looking over his shoulder a little bit, thinking that his job is in jeopardy with the way Crowder delivered that one. Look, I think it's funny because if you think, like, obviously Adam Gase likes to use a slot receiver, so it's super kind of existential to be like the slot receiver throwing a pass to another slot receiver. It's kind of, it just kind of blows your mind. But from a stats point of view, it is his first game with 90 plus yards since week five, obviously 13 receptions, 158 yards and a touchdown. That's really, really impressive when you look to see like what has gone on with this team and his impact on it. Jamison Crowder, really an underrated player across the league. 
And historically, when you look at the Jets franchise, Crowder becomes the third player to ever have a receiving touchdown and a passing touchdown in the same game. Freeman McNeil did it back in 1983 against Buffalo and Curtis Martin, that memorable game in 2000 down in Tampa to beat the Buccaneers when he threw that touchdown pass to Wayne Krebet there in the corner of the end zone. You mentioned Braxton Berrios, three catches, 60 yards, a touchdown, his first time in the end zone since week three in Indianapolis. And Berrios is one of those guys, Cynthia, that I know that he doesn't get as many reps in the offense, but when he does get an opportunity, the guy produces. He's really fast, too. It's kind of one of those people who you don't recognize his game speed until you actually go back and sort of look at it and measure it. So I was really impressed with that as well. He's been speedier than you might imagine. All right, let's flip over to the defensive side of the ball. Four players on the field for all 81 snaps against the Browns. Neville Hewitt, Marcus May, Bryce Hall, and Bless Austin. Remember, no Quinn and Williams in this one, no Harvey Longy. They both ended up on injured reserve. But it was other guys that stepped up. And when we talked earlier about Throw the records out the window. These guys are out there to win. These guys are out there to prove that not only they belong in the NFL, but they belong with this Jets team moving forward. Start with a guy like Bryce Hager, a team high 10 tackles in his first start of the season. It's amazing. You make your first start week 16 and you get 10 tackles. That's really very, very impressive. And Terrell Basham coming off the edge. I mean, look at the game that he had. He was almost unblockable at times. Five tackles a sack, one and a half tackles for loss, three hits on the quarterback, and a forced fumble, you know, and other guys like Frankie Luvu, Nathan Shepard, John Franklin Myers also had sacks of Baker Mayfield. These guys went out there and, again, played with such ferocious tenacity that really keyed that win for the Jets, I think. Absolutely. The defense really set the tone. Obviously, the Browns were missing some pieces on offense. Their wide receivers were decimated basically due to the COVID protocols. But that doesn't matter because you have to look to see what happened. The game was played. That's how it went, right? And they were able to not just be really effective against the pass, but also against the run. And it was because they were consistently bringing pressure. They were consistently stopping all of the different tricks that the, that the Browns had up their sleeves. So it was really a team effort and a team win. And the defense really led that. And Arthur Millette, a guy who's naturally a cornerback, but has had to play some safety the last couple of weeks, filled in again on the field for all but two snaps, had three passes defensed, and my goodness, when they targeted him on Sunday, it didn't go very well. Yeah, no, he just allowed three receptions on seven targets in his coverage, so nope, wasn't happening. Nope, nothing there. You mentioned the running attack of the Cleveland Browns, and you and I talked about it last week leading up to the game here. They were third in the National Football League. They average about 152 yards a game. That's really the strength of that offense. But the Jets only allowed 45 yards rushing on 18 carries, just two and a half yards a pop. That, to me, was maybe the biggest surprise in how they emerged victorious on Sunday. Ahead of this game, both Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt, obviously the two lead running backs for the Cleveland Browns, they ranked in the top five in one of the next-gen stats that's yards over expected. So when you have a situation like they do it all by down distance, time left, et cetera, what, how many yards should you get on that play? And typically, you see them just crushing it with more yards over expected than the other guys. But in this game, that was not the case at all. Despite having touchdowns each, their yards over expected was not – what you would imagine. I mean, obviously, 2.5 yards per rush overall as a team. That's not what you expect from this Browns offense. Kareem Hunt led all NFL running backs coming in with five and a half, five and a half yards a carry, just two and a half in this game against the New York Jets. So impressive performance. And why stop now, right? Because there's still one more game to play. And when we return, we're going to zero in on the Week 17 opponent, a familiar one at that for the Jets. That would be the New England Patriots. Stick around. More of the numbers game coming right up. Welcome to Bet365, the world's favorite sports book. You can bet on football, basketball, baseball, hockey, MMA, and soccer. You can even make a bet while the game is still being played. Yes, you can. But here's the best part. Bet365 is now available in New Jersey. Bet365, the world's favorite sports book, now in New Jersey. And welcome back to the numbers game. Dan Grasso alongside Cynthia Freeland of the NFL Network. And a familiar opponent again for the New York Jets. That would be the New England Patriots division foe. A rematch, Cynthia, of their battle on Monday Night Football back in Week 9 in MetLife Stadium. A game that the Jets came oh so close of winning. The Pats, though, emerged victorious 30-27 to as former Jet Nick Folk 
kicked the game-winning field goal that night. It was a game that Sam Darnold didn't play in, but Joe Flacco stepped in through three touchdown passes, and Brashad Perryman had 100 yards receiving and a couple of TDs. Feels like it's a completely different team now, though, right? Like, when you see what the Patriots have been doing the past few weeks and kind of what you saw in the beginning of the season, it does feel quite different, and it feels like a much lower hill to climb, if that makes sense. And the Jets certainly have a score to settle here. The Pats have won the last nine head-to-head -head in this rivalry. And the last time the Jets were victorious in Foxborough at Gillette Stadium, you got to go back to the famous can't-wait Bart Scott game in the playoffs in January of 2011. So it's been a long time coming. You know that that team would like to get off the schneid there and break back in the win column on Sunday. Yeah, it's interesting to see. Look, this this rivalry is always so fun to watch, right? And especially at the end of the season, this is going to be a, a weird one. Like, who's going to be playing quarterback for the Patriots? Are we going to see more Cam Newton? Or is it going to be Jarrett Stidham? Like, what, what are we doing here? It's going to be interesting. I think it's going to be Steve Grogan who's going to be at quarterback for the New England Patriots, if I can date myself a little bit. Well, we know it's not going to be Tom Brady, and yeah. that's probably one of the reasons why the Patriots have had the season that they've had here. They're 6-9. and nine. It's the first time they're not going to be in the playoffs since 2008, which was ironically the year that Tom Brady had his injury. And it's their first losing season since way back in 2000, Bill Belichick's first year at the helm when they finished 5-11. and 11. You know, they always say that the NFL is a cycle and the Patriots, for them, they're dealing with it right now. Yeah, it's interesting. Look, when you look back even just last week, the two things that stand out about the Buffalo game, one, the Patriots defense allowed 6.7 yards per play. That's a huge amount for a Pats defense, you know, in any era, really. And then if you look to see on the other side of the ball, they only completed a less than 43% of passing attempts. So they can't pass the ball very efficiently and they couldn't stop the Buffalo offense. So these are areas where these are all not things that we're used to from Bill Belichick or from the Patriots or from New England or kind of anything Thing in this rivalry not a recipe for success no doubt and you hit on it right that we still don't know who the starting quarterback is going to be uh cam newton was pulled in that game against the buffalo bills jared stidham mopped up the rest of the game there just 56 yards passing too collectively for that football team not good and you think about buffalo what they were able to do to send to, to the patriots cynthia finishing off the season sweep that's something that hasn't happened to this patriots team against a division opponent in 20 years Yep, it was a nice, I believe it was 2000 Miami and the Jets, 19-year streak. That was an NFL record, and it is done. Another We're, record crushed last week. You know what, 19 years, that's a heck of a run, though. You know, to keep it going that long, I think anybody would sign up for that. But all good things must come to an end, as the Pats are figuring out right now. Also, that game was their worst margin of defeat since 2003, when they lost to the Buffalo Bills 31 to nothing. Worst loss in the Bill Belichick era. Um, it was also the sixth game that they had trouble scoring points this year. Sixth game scoring 14 points or fewer, which, you know, for them was not too commonplace over the last couple of decades. No, it, it's, it's an interesting it's an interesting mark when you look to see Bill Belichick, what he is able to do. But really what happened was you look to see Cam Newton was unable to complete passes. He was just 5 of 10 in an interception. That's his career lower low as a passer. If you look to see what they were not able to do, in terms of being able to stop anything like these are two things where that is not how you score points. I mean, that margin of defeat is huge. And this is not what Bill Belichick's going to expect going forward either. Four starts with fewer than 100 yards passing for Cam Newton on the season. And look, I, I, you know, I don't know what his future is. That's not for us to decide, of course, here. But, you know, he really has looked like a shell of the guy who was the NFL MVP just five years ago, trying to restart his career with the New England Patriots, not going according to plan. Rushing. That's really been the key to their success, whatever success they've been able to achieve when it comes to the offensive side of the ball. They're fifth in the NFL in that department. Yeah, 145 yards per game. Damian Harris is the lead rusher, which is crazy, and he's missed two games. And Cam does have 12 rushing touchdowns. That's an interesting mark because overall for his career, that puts him over that 70 mark. So just him and Earl Campbell are the only number one overall picks to reach that 70 rushing touchdown mark, which is a fun historical note, but probably something the Patriots are like, well, we need to pepper in some passing touchdowns here too. That would be helpful. And it also just kind of speaks volumes to the freakish athletic ability that Cam Newton had, right, coming into the NFL. Because as you said, Earl Campbell's a Hall of Fame running back taken first overall. You expect him to have the 70-plus touchdowns, not a quarterback necessarily, but Cam was such a multidimensional threat coming out of Auburn, Heisman Trophy winner, national champion, number one overall pick, 
and he has that NFL MVP on his resume, but, you know, just hasn't been able to really showcase all of those things this year. All right, normally at this part of the show, Cynthia, we look ahead on the schedule to the next opponent, but there are no more opponents because this is going to be the end of the season. So we figured what we would do is, is look ahead to way down the line to the Jets' opponents that they're slated to play for 2021. Now, we should also caution you that there has been some rumors and some reports that the NFL may tack on a 17th regular season game next year, but that's not official yet. So what we'll do is we'll give you the 16 teams that they're slated to play if things continue on as normal. Home games are going to be against the three division opponents, Buffalo, Miami, and New England, plus Jacksonville, Tennessee, New Orleans, Tampa Bay, and Cincinnati. So at least on paper, you got some interesting teams coming to MetLife Stadium next year. Hopefully there's going to be a sold out building with fans back in the seats to root this football team on. Yeah, you got to hope so, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. And unfortunately, though, see, this past year, you know, the Jets came out to your neck of the woods a few times over out onto the West Coast. So if you're going to see the team in person, Cynthia, next year, you're going to have to get on the plane and come out east to see the team play because they're not going as far west in, uh, next season in 2021. Aha, you could be wrong. The Super Bowl is out here. So it's possible True. that I could potentially be seeing them in person and I guess it would be 2022, but still possible. Let's hope I'm wrong <laughs> as far as that's considered. Let's hope I am wrong there. Away games for the Jets, the three division opponents, Buffalo, Miami, New England, Houston, Indianapolis, Atlanta, Carolina. And then that last one will be either at the Chargers or at the Broncos based on where they fall in the standings. And that'll be figured out once the regular season is over. So, Cynthia, again, bittersweet that we have one more game left, but this is going to be the end of the road for you and I this year on the numbers game. I've had a blast. I've enjoyed working with you all season long. It's been a heck of a lot of fun. You know, the team necessarily didn't win as many games, but you and I brought it hard each and every week, and I can't wait to do it again next year. Absolutely. Have a great offseason. We'll all start our workouts, you know, so we'll be in tip-top shape come next season. Start crunching those numbers already. Start down in those Chaga Chinos, and September will be here before you know it. But, Cynthia, really, stay safe, be well, and I can't wait for next season. You too. Same to you. All right. That's Cynthia Freeland of the NFL Network. I'm Dan Grassa, and we want to thank all of you for being part of this journey with us all throughout the 2020 season. We'll see you next year on the numbers game. So long, everybody.